invite you to open your Bible with me tonight to the book of Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, we're coming back as we have begun this series and stepping out in faith courageously through this book, living a life that is strong and courageous in our faith. And if you like taking notes, I encourage you tonight to do so. We titled the message, The Preparation Before the Promise. The Preparation Before the Promise. And up until this point, we've seen now that Joshua is now the successor of Moses in leading the nation of Israel into the promised land, into the land that God had promised this nation. And this 10-day journey turned into a 40-year wilderness experience because the people complained because they were impatient and they started to sin along the way. But now finally, Moses has passed the baton now of leadership to Joshua, and Joshua is to lead the people across the Jordan River into the promised land. Now, what was the message that the Lord gave to Joshua, he said, arise and go now. (laughs) Move forward, advance now spiritually. And here we're going to see tonight how they move forward by faith. They move forward by faith. They're crossing over the Jordan. (laughs) So as we approach here, chapter 3, we know that there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of anticipation now for the momentum to advance spiritually, to go further now. And as we've learned now, the wilderness is now a place that symbolizes for us a life or a spiritual life of compromise in the wilderness, a life that continues to look back, a life that continues to give in to the flesh. But but now the promised land is a life or the spirit-filled life now, where you cross over from the carnal Christian to the Christian that is walking in the Spirit. That's why I want to ask you tonight, even before we go into this message, are you filled with the Spirit or are you walking in the flesh? Because you can be saved and still be walking in the flesh. Not truly be living in the Spirit, not truly showing the fruits of the Spirit in your life now. And before they get to the promised land, notice this, they have to go through the Jordan River. That's what we're going to see even tonight, that they're crossing the Jordan River. Crossing really marks the end of the self-life, notice this, and the beginning of the Christ life. And tonight, even some of us, whether we're here or we're watching online, we need to come to the place where it marks the end of the self-life, and we mark the beginning of the Christ life. Where he's saying, no longer do we want to live for ourselves. We want to go on now to spiritual maturity. We want to go on now in spiritual growth. Do you remember what the apostle in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, as he wrote to the Hebrews, he wrote this. He said, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or to maturity now. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works of faith, toward God. How, what did he say here? Let us go on. The only way to go on is by faith. The only way to go on is by faith. That's why we have to ask ourselves, what is standing in the way of me going on and to spiritual maturity? What is standing in the way of your spiritual walk, in the way of everything that God has planned for you that must be conquered? You see, for the nation of Israel, They identified that obstacle, and it was the Jordan River. They had to cross that obstacle that that was in the way of the fulfillment of God's will for their lives. Because when they crossed over, there was an enemy, the Canaanites, that they had to fight, that the Lord would drive them away to give them that land. But before they can fight the enemy, notice what happened. They had to cross a major hurdle. And for our lives, before we grow spiritually, you know, oftentimes what we have to do, cross major hurdles. 
That's why we have to ask ourselves, Lord, is there anything in the way that's standing in the way from me going on to faith, to growing spiritually, to, to reaching forward to everything that you have for me? Because notice this, it only happens by faith because unbelief says, let me go where it's safe. Let's go back to where it's safe. Let's go to what we've always known. That's what unbelief says. Let's do what we always have done. But faith, what it says is let's go forward to where God is working right now and to where God is moving right now. That's what faith says. It doesn't necessarily look back and stay at the past, but it looks forward to reach forward to everything that God has for us. And notice this, it's not really about how we begin our Christian walk, but it's about how we end that counts. It's about where we are right now that counts. It's about where we experience or what level of Christian experience we're living on. It's really left up to you to choose. Are you getting to live a low life of Christian experience where you never grow? Or are you going to say, Lord, I want to go to the next place where you want to take me? Lord, I want to continue to move forward to that which you have for me. Do you have enough faith to move forward? Just ask yourself, do you have enough faith to move forward? Because we do want to receive the promise of God, but we don't want to go through the preparation. And the preparation is really a process. There will there always be a preparation before we go through that promised land. We have to maintain ourselves. We're going to walk by faith. We have to maintain ourselves in a constant state of preparation. Those that are walking by faith understand that every season is a season of preparation for what God has next. And notice, just like we say where God guides, God provides, also where God leads, he also makes a way. That's why we're saying right now, Lord, you are the way maker. (laughs) Because he makes a way where he's leading. And we can claim the promises of God by taking the first step. Here in chapter 3, you know what they do? They take the first step. I love what Alan Redpath says in regards to taking the first step. He says this, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And the first step is usually the hardest. (laughs) Has God ever called you to do something and to step out in faith and he's given you a lot of vision, but the first step is always the hardest. Because it's going to require for you to leave what is safe, it's going to require for you to leave what is comfortable so that you can trust God on what he wants to do now. But I want you to know this as we read chapter 3, that that the steps of faith that you take encourage other people to also take steps of faith. I mean, you look at church history and the heroes of the faith that we see throughout the entire Bible, they all believed in God's promises and they did what God told them to do. You know what you know really when someone believes in God's promises? When they do what God says to do. They're walking in the promises of God. So let's read here Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 right now, as it says this, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from the Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, And the priests and the Levites bearing it, that you should set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it to about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, because we know that as you are calling us to cross over the Jordan so that we can inherit your promises, that you will always equip us with the measure of faith that we need, but you require our absolute obedience that we no longer live for the things of the flesh. But Lord, that we live after the Spirit. 
that we don't live our entire Christian lives as carnal Christians. That want to live according to our own ways instead of yours. So show us your way now. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And together we said, amen. Now let's look at the preparation here. The very first verse, you see the preparation. It begins, the preparation, it begins from the leadership. (laughs) You want to see a group of people prepared, then are the leaders prepared? Because if the leaders are not prepared, nor will the people be prepared. And here you see in Joshua a disciplined leader. How do you know that he's a disciplined leader? Well, let's read verse 1. It says, then Joshua rose early in the morning. (laughs) You see discipline there already. He's an early riser here. He is spending time with the Lord. We know that because God already spoke to him through Moses to not leave the word of God. Don't go to the right or to the left. But his faith here or the steps of faith that he's about to take are nurtured by the word of God. He's rising early to spend time with the Father. Uh, We love this because Joshua is symbolic of Jesus in the Old Testament. His name means Yeshua. Do you remember back in Mark in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 35, where it speaks of the devotional life of Christ, where it says, Now when the morning had been risen long before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. You see, we learn here right from verse 1 that the people that God uses and blesses know how to discipline themselves, know not only themselves, but their bodies so that they can give themselves completely to the Lord in the early hours of the morning. You want to be blessable before the Lord? God's Spirit will always be poured upon the blessable. You want to be blessable? Then become available to God early in the morning. Lord, here I am early in the morning. I want to hear your voice. God will bless the blessable, those that are available to hear from him. And it says, as you rose early in the morning, notice here, he and the nation of Israel set out from the Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and they lodged there before they crossed. Now we see that as they rose early, they set out, they went on the journey now, until they arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, and they camped there at the banks before they crossed. Now, I love the picture that it gives us here because they are at the banks now of the Jordan River. They are at the edge of faith and obedience. And now they have to make a decision. Some of us tonight even are there at the edge of faith, at the edge of obedience, and we have to make a decision. Will we go and do what God called us to do? Or are we going to stay in the wilderness for the rest of our lives? Where they're looking at what God has called for us, but are, is your heart ready for the blessing that God has prepared for you? Now notice what happens because now he casts the vision now to the leaders. And in verse 2 it says this as we continue reading. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. Now we have to really pay attention to what's happening here. Because first for three days in chapter 1 and 2, they prepared themselves. And now for another three days, something else, a different type of preparation happens. Don't you just love that when you read God's word, you understand that God is a God of preparation and what he does, it's always done with a process. (laughs) It's always done in phases now. God is a God of process. And in his process, he's always preparing us. I want you to remember that tonight. In God's process, he is always preparing us. So there were three more days of preparation in this process and in this time. And what happened was, it says, so I was after three days, the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, look at the orders that happens here. As they go out through the camp and they want to really instruct the people to focus on one thing here, it says here, and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests of the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. See, there there is vision here. Notice, there is vision for the Ark of the Covenant. There is vision for the Ark of the Covenant. And what does the Ark of the Covenant represent for us? The presence of God. 
the most holy place. There is vision here for the presence of God. Do you know here, even in this chapter, more than 11 times the Ark of the Covenant is made reference to, the presence of God is made reference to, because before they crossed, notice where their attention had to be, the presence of God had to be the center of attention. Not anything else. As it represented the presence of God, he says, when you see the priests and when you see the Levites carrying, then, only then, set out or get up and go after it. Follow the presence when you see the presence of God begin to cross the Jordan River. What an example for us. That when the presence goes, the people of God go. (laughs) When the presence moves, God's people move. And here what what they're instructing the people that they ought to learn to follow after the presence of God. Why is this important for us today? Because oftentimes when we take steps of faith, you know what we want to do is we want to go ahead of the presence of God. And that's where we get in trouble. We have to learn to never go before the presence of God, never become impatient with God's timing. You know what is awesome here about this verse is that it really teaches us that the presence of God should lead the way. Not mechanics, not processes, not methods, not protocols. And we often try to lead from the front with the protocol instead of from the front with the presence of God. And that becomes really dangerous in the church. Because it's only the presence of God that makes a way, that leads the way where there is no way. That's why we, in Christian leadership, as believers, as men and women, we must be careful that we don't try to lead our families, our churches, our ministry from the front now with secular methods instead of with spiritual weapons. How many times have we been guilty of that? That we want to lead the church with secular methods instead of with the presence of God, instead of with prayer, and and then you know what happens is that the presence of God no longer is leading And instead of consecrated, you know what we become is carnal. Carnal because we're not depending upon God's spirit. Do you remember in Mount Sinai what Moses said? (laughs) He was in Mount Sinai and the Lord told him, it's time for you to keep going to the promised land to lead these people down the wilderness. And in Exodus chapter 33, what, what Moses said, it says, then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. What what an attitude that Moses had. He said, Lord, if your presence doesn't go, then I don't want to go. If your presence goes, then I don't want to stay. And if your presence stays, then I don't want to go. Do you have that attitude tonight? That as you see the spirit of God moving and the, the, the presence of God going, are you following after the presence of God? We have to be so sensitive that we don't become Christians that depend and rely on all the wrong things. That we're trying to lead a spiritual work in the flesh without the presence of God leading us. And, And you know what happens after you've been in the wilderness for a long time? You don't even know it. After you've lived so many years in carnality, you can't even tell any longer that you're not being led by the Spirit of God. That's why it's so important for us to pause and say, Lord, am I following your presence? Look at in verse 4 what happens here because it says, yet there shall be a space though. (laughs) The presence of God is going to be your guide. And you want to focus now your eyes on the presence of God. Notice what it says in verse 4. There shall be a space between you and it about 200 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go for you have not passed this way before so that you don't get lost. (laughs) But as you focus your eyes on it, notice here, there has to be a distance between you and the ark. What's this distance here specifically? It was speaking about a half a mile clear distance. Stay about half a mile behind the presence of God for two reasons. Number one, to respect the holy nature of the presence of God. Don't come near it. (laughs) Because the presence of God is holy. You cannot just approach the presence of God however you want, number one. But number two, stay behind it so that everyone gets a clear view of the ark. 
Stay right behind it so that you can get a clear view of the presence of God. Isn't that amazing here that that's what we receive, that as the Lord is our guide, you know what we ought to do? Get a clear view of the presence of God because there's always a temptation for us to want to lead. There's always a temptation for us to want to get ahead. And when we begin to get ahead, notice this, God can't bless what we're doing. So here he's saying, make sure that you follow the presence so that you know the way that you should go since you have never been this way before. You see, when when we're taking steps of faith, it's so important that we're sensitive to where God wants us to go. Here specifically, it says it even in verse 4, because you may not know the way which you may go because you have not passed this way before. You've never done this before. You've never stepped out this way before. You've never crossed the Jordan River before. So all the more, you should be sensitive about following the presence of God. You know why we get lost? Because we get ahead. And we become impulsive and we become impatient. And then that place where God wants us to take us, we never arrive there. The worst thing for the Christian is to be at a place where the presence of God no longer is at or to be following a presence other than the presence of God. Maybe attracted to the presence of man, maybe attracted to to hype or to a movement or to a method. I I love this because it, it forces us to ask the question, are you being led by emotions today or are you being led by the presence of God? So here the leaders are telling the nation of Israel, get a clear view of the ark and go only where God is leading. Follow God because he's going to make a highway for them to follow. And it's, it's important for us because if we don't have a clear view of Christ in our lives right now, we're never going to grow. If there are things obstructing our view of Christ, we will never grow. What did the apostle in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 say? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus now. And whatever he's doing, keep your eyes on that. Be spiritually prepared for whatever God might want to do. (laughs) Why is it that this presence of God was necessary? Because the battle that we're in and that they were in was a spiritual battle. And they had to be spiritually prepared. So that when the presence moved, they also moved as well. Notice here, people need to be led by the presence of God, not by the manipulation of man. You know what's sad oftentimes? And when the presence of God is leading, and then we want to tamper with God's leadership and the presence of God. We want to get in the way. (laughs) We have to ask God, Lord, get me out of the way so that you can lead to the place of promise. So that I follow your leadership. So that I don't rely on my own strategy. I don't rely on my own method instead of relying on God to do the impossible. Do you remember Zerubbabel chapter 4 verse 6 where the Lord encouraged now the governor now Zerubbabel in Zechariah 4 6? What did the prophet Zechariah tell Zerubbabel when he said, you know what, I can't rebuild the temple? Well, Zechariah said, he answered and said to him, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. By the spirit of God, says the Lord of hosts. Now notice what happens here in verse 5 as we continue reading, because Joshua now is going to tell the people to continue to prepare themselves spiritually. And notice here in verse 5, this is critical here. This is spiritual here. He doesn't say go and and get weapons. (laughs) He doesn't say go and gather the people that have the most experience. In fact, he says, and Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves. (laughs) You can't cross if you're not sanctified. You won't make it. This is a spiritual warfare now, and spiritual battles require spiritual preparation. Would you remember that tonight? Spiritual battles require spiritual preparation. Before the crossing was the consecration. What does this mean here? Sanctify yourselves. Prepare your heart. <laughs> Prepare your heart. 
Because outside, you may look like you're ready. Outside, you may be saying all the right things. But how does your heart look? How does your heart look? Outside, you can say everything to make everyone believe that you are ready. But is your heart prepared before the Lord to do what he's called you to do? You know what sanctification means? I mean, this is so awesome, sanctification. Here's a full doctrine of sanctification here in the Old Testament, in Joshua chapter 3. And really what it means is to be separated from the things that are unclean or common. He's saying before we cross, separate yourself, cleanse yourself from any pride, from any division, for many sin that needs to be confessed and needs to be forsaken now so that we can focus on the Lord as we cross. You see, you can't take into the promised land sin. You can't take into the promised land pride. You'll never make it to the promised land in division. That's why you have to sanctify yourself. Here he's saying purify yourselves. Make yourself holy because Holiness, you know what it means? It means usefulness. And to the level that you are holy, it's going to be the same level that God can use your life. Now now look at what he's saying here. Sanctify yourselves. Why? For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. (laughs) There's the encouragement. Everybody wants to see the wonders. Lord, I want to see wonders among us, Lord. You know, the Hebrew translation for wonders is the word where we receive today the word miracles. Everybody's wowed by miracles. We want to see the hand of God be moved powerfully among us. But you know what grieves the hand of God and the Holy Spirit from working among us? Unconfessed sin. A people that refuse to be sanctified. Here he's saying, put all your sin away through repentance. Put all your sin away through submission to God now, and to his promises. And notice here, let him change you. (laughs) Let him change you now. And the process of sanctification is the transformation of our character. You want to know if you're being sanctified, then how does your character look? How does your heart look now in sanctification? Alan Redpath said this, the wonder-working power of God always depends on the sanctification of his people now. The level on which God meets men depends on the level on which we as Christians are prepared to meet our Lord. How are you prepared to meet our Lord today? The level that he will meet you at is the level of holiness that you are prepared to meet him. Holiness is the prerequisite to great wonders among God's people. We want to see the hand of God move, then we have to be ready with holiness. This is the best preparation or purification in order to take spiritual steps of faith, in order to fight spiritual battles that can't be done in the flesh. They cannot be done in carnality. Just ask yourself today, are are we clean enough for God to use us? Are you clean enough today for God to use us? Or are, are we now humble enough for God to entrust us with his blessing or will we take the glory for ourselves? You know, before God does wonders among his church, he needs to know if he can trust us. Are you clean enough? Are, are we humble enough? Have we repented enough for God to say, my spirit is ready to be poured upon these believers? Because holiness, really what it is, it's nothing more and it's nothing less than the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and it's being poured out. That the life of Christ is flowing through you. That's what holiness means. That when people see you, you know what they see? They see Jesus in you. (laughs) Because the Holy Spirit is flowing through your life. Now let's look here at verse 6. It says, then Joshua spoke to the priest saying, After Joshua told the people, you're going to follow them, notice he speaks to the leaders as well. He holds the leaders accountable. And he tells the leaders this, take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. I want you to circle in your Bible, cross over. (laughs) 
Maybe today you're saying, Lord, if you gave me a sign today at church that I have to take a step of faith, Lord, if you're giving me a sign of faith and obedience, then I'll do it. Well, I want to tell you tonight, there's your sign, crossover. <laughs> God is speaking to his church to move forward to take up the presence of God and lead his people with the presence of God. Crossover, notice what it says. Take the ark and lead the way across the river and go up by faith. But why does he tell the leaders to take up the presence of God? Because it's in the presence of God that they can lead the way. And notice he speaks to the leaders first because you can't lead people to a place that you've never been yourself. You cannot lead anyone to a place you've never been yourself and, and your faith now, and, and it can never go farther now than you've been in the presence of God. Your faith can never go farther than you have been in the presence of God. How much time are you spending in the presence of God? That your faith is growing stronger. I love what F.B. Meyer said. He said, God permits the Jordans to educate our faith. <laughs> there are certain Jordan rivers that God places before us. And you know what? They're there for to educate our faith so that our faith can grow and it can be led now into greater victories now. Before people can follow you, you know what they want to know? What kind of faith do you have? Joshua here was spending time with the Lord. He was hearing from the Lord, and he was telling the people now, from receiving of the word of God, it's time to take the ark and leave the people. And you know that the word of God was on Joshua's lips. He was, it was on Joshua's mind, but notice this. The word of God was on Joshua's actions. On Joshua's actions. How do we know that? Because he was ready to obey. And notice what he tells him here now, Verse 7, the Lord speaking to Joshua. And the Lord said to Joshua, <laughs> I want you to know that this here not only is the preparation, but here is the exaltation that God is raising up Joshua. It wasn't anyone else but the Lord. <laughs> the Lord said this. It wasn't man that was saying this. It was the hand of God. Notice what the Lord says. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel. Now notice here, the Lord said he was going to exalt Joshua. Notice this word, this day. First we see that exaltation, when God's going to use a person, it's going to be the Lord. It's not going to be out of man's promotion. What does the Bible tell us in Psalm 75? Exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one, and what does he do? Exalts another. God is the judge. He is the one that this day, now notice this day because it speaks about time. At God's appointed time, he was going to raise up, now Joshua, he says, notice this. At this day, I am going to raise you up. I am going to exalt you. The word exalt you means I'm going to use you greatly. I'm going to make you a great leader in the sight of all Israel. Now notice what he's speaking to Joshua about. God was going to make out of Joshua a leader like the kind Moses was as well. I'm going to make you a leader in the eyes of the people of Israel. Notice here, just like Moses was a leader in the eyes of the people of Israel. And I'm going to, notice here this verse, I'm going to confirm it. How will God apply the confirmation here? God will miraculously apply this confirmation that God's hand was undeniably on Joshua. Why? Because the Jordan River was going to open. <laughs> and people would have no doubt that God's hand was upon Joshua and leading him to cross. Now, the Jordan River, and as they saw the miracles, they saw the hand of God moving in the life of Joshua. So that they would know that as, as God was with Moses, he was also with Joshua. He was reaffirming now. God's call on the life of Joshua. Notice here what it says, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. What is the promise here that, that Joshua is receiving? He's being reminded, Lord, I know that you've called me to this. But also he's being reminded that I will be with you. The promise of the presence of God. He was faithful in private, notice, and he was honored in public. This was the encouragement that God was giving him. 
Just imagine Joshua receiving this type of encouragement. This encouragement gave him the faith to meet the need that was at hand. He's saying, this day, Joshua, I'm going to now give you the faith that you need. I'm going to give you the encouragement. I'm going to make you a great leader in the eyes of the nation of Israel. You know what the nation of Israel would see? They would see God's hand on Joshua as it was on Moses. And we continue reading. Notice here in verse 8, you shall command the priests or give them the leadership who bear the ark of the covenant, saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. (laughs) Now look at that verse, and really let's pay attention to that verse. (laughs) When it's time for you now to cross, I want you to tell the priests to go to the Jordan, but then to stand in the Jordan. Command them to take a few steps into the Jordan. (laughs) How many times do we say, Lord, here I am at the edge of the Jordan? I'm ready to obey you, but I want you to open the Jordan, then I'll put my feet in. (laughs) No, that's not the way it works. The Lord says, you have to put your feet in. You have to get your feet wet. And sometimes what we like to say, we want to be really safe. We come to the edge of the Jordan, but we never step in. We come to the edge of the Jordan, standing on the side of the wilderness, but we never step in to what God wants to do in our lives. Before God parts the waters, you know what he asks of us? To step in the waters. And we don't have to understand everything. The only thing you need to do is obey. You don't have to understand the entire process, but we need to come to that Jordan of our lives at some point in our lives and say, Lord, here I am to obey. You know what has to happen before you step into the waters? You have to step out from where God has you. Lord, I want to step out from where you have me. I want to step up to my calling of holiness. And Lord, I also want to step into the promises of God that I would not live in disobedience. I don't want to come short of everything that you have planned for me. (laughs) Have you seen maybe God's calling on your life or someone's life and they stop short or we oftentimes stop short of everything that God wants to do among us Because we don't step in by faith. And we say, Lord, I don't want to step in. Lord, if I I step in the Jordan, I might get wet. (laughs) If I step in the Jordan, I might drown. Lord, if I step in the Jordan, I might be in danger. God doesn't expect us to understand everything. He expects our obedience out of us. And notice in verse 9, as we continue reading now, as he commands now the people to step out, it says, So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. What an exhortation here. Come here and listen. Listen to what God is saying because they were probably scared. (laughs) Joshua, you want us to do what? Joshua, you know, we've been following you. We'll take the ark all the way to the edge. But when it comes to the edge, maybe that's up to you. You have to carry it over. You know what he's saying? Come here and listen to what God is saying. I'm going to give you instructions from the words of the Lord. Here, Joshua is hearing from God. He doesn't miscommunicate. There's one message from God, and it's a clear message. It's only God speaking here. And this is almost Joshua being a mouthpiece for the Lord now, a messenger or a spokesman for God now. It's almost as as, as Christ. What did Jesus say? He said, only as the Father says, so I say as well. Whatever he speaks, I'm speaking as well. Like Moses before him, notice what happens to Joshua now. He's receiving his orders from God. This is why he says, come and listen to what God is saying. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you, And that he will, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivitites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Come here and listen to what God is saying. By this you know that God is with us, and he will not fail, notice that word, to drive out the Canaanites. And everyone else living in the promised land, it wasn't only about inheriting the land, it was also about driving out those that were living in the land. Why was this important to drive out those that were living in the land? Because they were sinful people. And if they didn't drive out the sin, you know what was going to happen to the rest of the people that were coming in? It would corrupt the holiness. 
What happened later on in the book of Joshua, we saw that they compromised and they allowed those that God said to drive out to stay in. The worst thing that can happen to us is to keep sin in that eventually corrupts the rest of the body. Do you see how corruption spreads so quickly? By this you will know that God's going to drive out the people that are there now in the land. Because the people were to be killed or defeated in battle now as they're going and they're entering the land now. The people that are living in sinful immorality, this was necessary so that the nation of Israel would remain holy. Behold, verse 11, or focus, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Look at the ark. Look at the ark because the spiritual battle is to be won right now. And then he says this, Now therefore, take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. Now notice this, calling all the men to spiritual leadership. Men in the tribes, one man from each tribe responsible to be the example. Why calling the men? Because the men are called to be the example on what it means to live a life filled with the Spirit. Men rise to the occasion. Men, you are entrusted with the responsibility to represent now and to lead the procession forward now. And it goes on and it says, and it it shall come to pass that as soon as the souls of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that come down from upstream, they shall stand as a heap. What an amazing thing that Where God leads, he makes a way. He is the way maker. As soon as the soles of the feet touch the Jordan, notice what's going to happen now, that the waters will stop and they will stand up like a wall now. Joshua said, by this you will know that the living God is among you and he's going to drive out the people. Once you see the Jordan split and it will now stand up like a wall, this would be an attestation now that you know, notice this, that God is going to give you the land. We have an awesome God that as we step out in faith along the way, he gives us several (laughs) spiritual victories that only serve in our lives as confirmation. Have you ever stepped out in faith and you saw, Lord, thank you for that victory. (laughs) You know what that victory is in your life? Confirmation that God is leading the way. Step out and watch the Lord part the waters. Step out and see what God wants to do. Just imagine how many miracles, and really pay attention to this, how many miracles we don't see because we're too scared to step out. Just think about how many things God wants to do among us, but we never see any of those things because we don't obey the Lord. Joshua, because of his faith, he didn't see the Jordan River as a, as a problem. He saw the Jordan River as an opportunity for God to work. He wasn't too scared to cross when God told him to cross. And that's what we have to say, Lord, right here, we're at a place where whatever you want for us, Lord, we're ready to cross to the next place that you have for us, to the next season that you have for us, because we want to always remain obedient. When you remain obedient, notice God can do what he wants to do. But when you come with your own method and plan, notice what happens. What you're saying is we no longer are letting the presence lead. It's so obvious when the presence of God is leading. You know why? Because you see the presence of God just flowing through the lives of the people. Him doing a natural work that only he can do. And notice notice how they actually cross. Not only the preparation, the exaltation of God's hand upon the nation of Israel and Joshua, but in verse 14, they crossed the Jordan River. They started to walk with their feet. (laughs) They didn't say, well, okay, you know what? We're going to cross and... Later on, others will cross. No, they stepped out in faith together. They took steps of faith together. Let's look at this verse in verse 14. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. that They started to cross now. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, the feet of the priests who bore the Ark now dipped in the edge of the water for the Jordan overflows at its banks during the whole time of harvest. What does this mean? That during this time, the Jordan River was not shallow. It was deep through all all ends. 
This speaks that there was a great miracle. This was a, a great work of God. It said when it came to time now for them to be led through the procession of the leaders, of the presence of God, and of the people following now, they put their feet in the water and the Lord parted the Jordan. <laughs> now notice how everything, how it describes it in verse 14 and 15, that it was done decently and in order. Can we not appreciate when God does things, it's done decently and in order? Without confusion, because God is leading the way. And they're doing it in unity. They're doing it together. It's been said before, if you want to go fast, then go alone. <laughs> but if you want to go far, then go together. Because there's strength in unity. Now notice verse 16, it says, and that the waters which came down from the upstream stood still. The waters stood still. Lord, I'm scared of the waters. But the waters stood still. And rose up in a heap very far at the Adam, the city that was behind Zeratan. So the waters that went down into the sea of Arabah, the salt sea failed and they were cut off and the people crossed over the opposite of Jericho. Well, isn't that awesome that the Lord will make the water stand still so me and you can cross to the place that he wants us to cross? God wants us to go farther than where we are today. But you know what's really oftentimes keeping us back? Our lack of faith, our unbelief, and our disobedience. Because in our mind, we have our own program as to how things should look. We have our own program as we how, think, how we want things to be. The moment our program becomes more important than what God wants to do, we'll never arrive at the place where God wants us to arrive. We'll never get there. God here specializes in doing the impossible. <laughs> but in order for us to be able to see that, we have to be willing to say, Lord, we know that you're the promise keeper. This is faith in obedience and action. God didn't bring us out of Egypt. God didn't bring the nation of Israel out of Egypt, which is symbolic to us of the world now, so that we can live our entire Christian life in the wilderness. He brought us out of Egypt so that we can, by faith, cross the Jordan River. Remember in, in Hebrews, when it speaks about faith, the entire book of Hebrews, in chapter 3, verse 19, it says, so we see that they could not enter, the nation of Israel, some could not enter in because of unbelief. Some could not enter in because of unbelief. What keeps us away from entering? Unbelief. What keeps us away from moving forward? Sin. What keeps us away from not stepping out to where God wants us is that we don't sanctify ourselves and we don't let the presence of God lead. Now notice the last verse, verse 17. Then the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm. You can stand firm taking steps of faith. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to doubt. You can be confident in the step of faith that you took because the presence of God was leading the way. <laughs> have you ever taken a step of faith? And you know what you begin to do when you start to see the waters? You begin to doubt the, the decision that you made. But when you focus on the presence of God, you don't have to doubt the decision that you made to follow the Lord. You can stand firm in the promises of God. They were standing firm. Where were they standing firm? In the middle of the Jordan River, surrounded by water, yet they were still standing firm. <laughs> what an amazing picture. We can be surrounded by strong waters, but still be standing firm in steps of faith because we're being obedient to what he called us to do. Now notice what happens here. Standing firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan and all Israel and all the people had crossed over, completely over, now following the leadership of Joshua now. What does it show us here? That they receive, they experience not only God's power, but God's provision. The, the Jordan was now split so that they can cross over, and it was now completely now open for them to go until the entire nation of Israel had crossed. And they waited for everyone to make it to the other side. Now, even as we close right now, I want to ask you, are you 
lingering in the banks of the Jordan River of obedience, of the spirit-filled life? Are you looking still, hesitating whether or not you're going to take a step of faith when God has called you into the waters? And sometimes we're, we're thinking about it still. <laughs> Lord, I'm not sure I want to do that. But whatever God commands us to do, notice this, he's always going to give us also the grace to do it. He's always going to give us the faith to do it. When we obey him, he's going to make a way when we choose to obey, regardless of our fears and regardless of how impossible it looks. Regardless of how impossible it looks. Notice here, for the Christian life, For the Christian life, the only place that you stand firm in is in the promises of God. You stand firm in it in the promises of God. But the Christian life really never stands still in the Christian life. You never really stand still in the Christian life. Why? Because you're either moving forward in faith or you're going backward in unbelief. You either are moving forward in faith or you're going backward backward in unbelief. That's why tonight we have to ask ourselves, Lord, what is standing in the way of my obedience? Jesus went to the cross to clear the way to victory, to clear the way of victory over all things. Doesn't the Bible tell us in Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 that he has disarmed principalities and powers. He made a, a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in the cross. He went and he made a way now. But what it takes from us when we want to be the place that God calls us to be, it takes for a yielded heart. A heart that says, all right, Lord, whatever you want from me, that I will do. I don't want to deny the Lord anything. Lord, whatever you want from me, that I will do. A yielded heart always takes us and a yielded heart always leads us through the river that leads us into the promises of God.